fuel cells are, are highly touted as an environmentally friendly fuel source. What exactly is a fuel cell? Well, a fuel cell is a way to make electricity without burning things. And typically you put in a fuel like hydrogen or methanol and it reacts with, uh, with uh, a catalyst in a, in a system and produces electricity without actually burning anything. It's a chemical reaction and so it's a very clean way to make electricity. Now the first fuel cell was actually invented back in 1839 by Sir William Grove. Right. Um, we've certainly come a long way since 1839. Give us an idea of the existing and emerging fuel cell technologies that are out there. Well, there's a whole host of fuel cells. They started to really gain momentum during the space program when people needed to produce power in space without running motors or engines, you know, things like that. Um, and in the past, I'd say, 20 or 30 years, they've been developed and gotten better, been become more efficient, where today they're starting to be used in many applications around the world for stationary power sources, for backup power sources, for, for when the grid goes out. The biggest application today actually is in forklifts. <laughs> Why forklifts? Well, because they're inside and you don't want the emissions? Well, exactly. <laughs> they, they're completely clean. They produce only water. There's no burning. There's no off gas in an enclosed space. These are important things. And compared to a, a, a battery forklift, they recharge much faster. So you can just refuel a forklift with hydrogen and within a few minutes, the forklift is back in operation, whereas you'd have to take a forklift and recharge it for you know tens of minutes or hours or things like that. In fact, I read that a, a fuel cell actually can never go dead. Well, uh, it's just like your car engine. You just keep putting more fuel in it, and that's what happens. So uh, a battery will run out and need to be charged, but a fuel cell with a continuous source of, of hydrogen or methanol could keep running indefinitely. Now, so far, the United States has dedicated more than a billion dollars in fuel cell mm -hmm. research and development. Um, give us an idea of, of why government, industry, universities like Penn State are mm -hmm. so interested in this. Well, the, there are just a, a, a whole host of different reasons why people are interested in fuel cells, but probably the primary one is that it's environmentally a very clean way to power things, um, and particularly in transportation. Typical car engine will burn gasoline and emits all sorts of pollution. Um, a fuel cell will emit only water. So from an environmental point of view, it's a very desirable fuel. But also, recent projections have so shown that over the next 30, 50, 100 years, it's actually the best way, the most economically or energy efficient way to power automobiles. This sounds so good that I'm thinking there has to be some downside, <laughs> is there? Is there one? Well, um, right now they're expensive. And they don't last as long as, say, a regular car engine. So really, there are downsides in terms of the efficiency uh, of the longevity of the system. And also, one of the big questions is, how do we store hydrogen? Well, you can compress it, and like natural gas, that means you have compressurized tanks on a vehicle, which, which some people dangerous. say could be dangerous. But if you've ever seen a Hollywood film, uh, one would argue that a tank of gasoline can be kind of dangerous as well. Um, and yet millions of us drive around with right, these rockets. Right. I think probably the other main reason is how are we going to make that hydrogen? It, it's not something we can poke a, a tube in the ground and, and pump up oil like we do with oil. How are we going to make that hydrogen? And so there's great interest in making renewable hydrogen because uh, ultimately if it's going to be an environmentally friendly way to make energy, it's got to rely on something other than fossil fuels. And that brings us to something that you're doing that's very exciting. In fact, you're an inventor of a new electrically assisted microbial fuel cell that doesn't require oxygen, uh, that converts organic matter, often waste matter, to yeah. electricity. Tell us about that. Well, um, actually, it's it, it's kind of interesting. You take the same, you take a fuel cell which you put in, say, hydrogen and oxygen, and you get out electricity. If you turn that around, if you put electricity into it you produce hydrogen and oxygen. It's something that can re run reversibly. So we take uh, a microbial fuel cell which has bacteria. The bacteria eat up organic matter and they release electrons. You know, when you and I eat, we eat food and what we're really doing is burning the food. We're, we're taking electrons out of that food and electrons are current. So these bacteria are able to eat and make electricity uh, instead of using oxygen. Tell us a little bit about the fuel source or the, or the feedstock, because it sounds like you can take scraps from the salad bar. You yeah, can take you've, you've, scraps from 
anything. You've anything. Seen, okay. You've seen uh, what is it, Back to the Future, right? The car drives up, Mr. Fusion's written on the back of the car, and they start pouring in uh, banana peels and garbage cans and things like that. Well, that's a little futuristic. Uh, this is not quite so futuristic and uh, far-fetched, though, because anything that's biodegradable, anything that bacteria can use, can theoretically be used to make electricity. And in the same way, anything that's used to make electricity in this process with just a little bit of boosting of the electricity made by the bacteria can evolve hydrogen gas. So you have the opportunity to take banana peels or wastewater, you know, your local wastewater treatment plant is a source of organic matter. It's, it could be your, your local wastewater treatment plant could be a power plant. <laughs> and you can take that organic matter and either make electricity instead of consuming electricity or make hydrogen, but that would require a little bit of electricity so to be consumed. You're talking about this little boost of, of energy that's required mm -hmm. to get this whole process in, in motion. Right. Um, how does that compare with the energy input that's required for our leading alternative fuel at this point, which was ethanol, and, and often at this point, or most often, corn-based ethanol that is a food source. So here yeah. you're talking about garbage, yeah. food, well, the big hope for ethanol, of course, is to use cellulose, the, 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 the leftover crop materials or wood or trees or things like that. But in order to make ethanol out of cellulose, you have to break that cellulose down into sugars. Now, bacteria can't do that because if the bacteria are going to break down the cellulose, they want to eat it. One thing that's very nice about uh, what we do to make hydrogen is the bacteria, we make use of bacteria that already know how to break down cellulose into things which produce either hydrogen or byproducts that can also be made to, to, into hydrogen. So while we have to come up with these enzymes to break down cellulose and then ferment those things into, into ethanol, we can already use bacteria that exists naturally in nature to do what we want to do. And this little boost of electricity is almost insignificant. Well, you need, um, well, you need a lot of energy to split water. We only need about a tenth of that in our process to use um, to make uh, to make hydrogen in this uh, electri so electrochemically assisted process. This may be a, a silly question, but what's bec what becomes of the bacteria? Um, they live happily ever after. They just go on and eat and they make new bacteria and eventually they produce some solids that you can recycle and make into more bacteria. Now you said futuristic a moment ago yeah. and, and the goal is uh, that fuel cell vehicles will be practical and cost effective by the year 2020. Are mm -hmm. we on track to achieving that? We are on track to achieving fuel cell vehicles and vehicles that use hydrogen whether it's economically practical, uh, I can't address. But let me tell you some recent uh, developments. BMW is now marketing a vehicle, which you can buy, which runs on hydrogen. It's not a fuel cell, it's a combustion-based process. Just like your current car burns gasoline or, na or a car can burn natural gas, this uses hydrogen. And in fact, we have a bus in Center County that's running on natural gas and hydrogen. That's right. The whole fleet of uh, buses in State College runs on natural gas. And we have a hydrogen refueling station here in State College, and that refueling station produces a blend of natural gas and hydrogen. That bus uses that fuel and actually burns much cleaner than a natural gas bus, which burns much cleaner than a diesel bus. So we already have that technology in State College. Now to go to a fuel cell technology is another step, because that, again, is not a, a burning, a, a combustion-based technology. And uh, Honda will be uh, selling vehicles very shortly that are fuel cell vehicles that people can buy. I don't know what the price tag is. Do you have a um, guess? Can you venture a guess? <laughs> what? Can you venture a guess of, of how much something like that would cost? Oh, I don't know. You know, I'm sure whatever it costs, they're going to take a loss on getting the first few vehicles out. But much, I think, was said about the first uh, Priuses sold by Toyota, the first hybrid cars. It was said that Toyota took a loss on those first few cars in order to make lots of them so that they could then make up for those losses in economy of scale. Now, you mentioned a moment ago that, um, that the bacteria can feed on, on wastewater, and, mm -hmm. and we know we spend a lot of money in this country on wastewater treatment, uh, but in other countries, there are some two billion people on the planet who, who don't have adequate sanitation. I'm wondering right. what the implications uh, with your work are for those people. Well, we hope it's the answer. Um, the, 
the fact that a third of the people lack adequate sanitation means that a third of the population of the world is essentially living in an environment which is not healthy. And the global spread of human uh, diseases around the planet is a major concern. We hope this is a technology which can be put in in uh, with uh, 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 small towns, buildings, uh, or even centralized plants where electricity is generated. And if, if something is generated that people want, they'll keep the process going. If you put in a current reactor, it requires energy. And so there's no incentive to keep it going if it breaks. It's not providing mm -hmm. anything for you. But this would be, well, let's say that this, um, this reactor is, is running a drinking water well. It's a pump for a drinking water well. or maybe less um, uh, uh, relevant to the water infrastructure, maybe it's running a cell phone tower. That energy, if it stops, stops those devices from working. So what you want to do is keep them going, and so there's incentive to maintain that technology, and that's something we're lacking with existing treatment processes, even if we were to put them around the world. Now, what we have now is a, a, an oil-based economy. How far off is a hydrogen economy, and can we produce uh, bacterial hydrogen on a large scale anytime soon? Well, um, there are people that would say that we're on the path to a hydrogen economy. Globally, there's activities going on in Germany, in Japan, in Iceland, and in the U.S. Whether that's going to be a significant part of the economy, we don't know. And I, I, I would hazard a guess that it's probably 10 or 20 or 30 years off before it's a huge part of the economy. But that's part of a, a decision that we have to make in this country. We have to decide, do we want to move forward in a substantial way with these alternative technologies? Because certainly when we make a decision to do so, they can evolve quite rapidly. Now, the, the National Science Foundation, which funds your research, mm -hmm. says that, that other systems produce hydrogen on a larger scale, but few, if any, um, uh, new systems are as energy efficient as yours are. I'm wondering in the bottom line, how important is what you're doing to our nation's security and, and ultimately to our economic well-being? Well, um, it all depends on our ability to scale up these systems. If they are scalable and they can do what we can do in the laboratory, they'll have a big impact. If, if we can't do that economically or efficiently, then it'll be a small impact. And, and that's, that's the part of research. You know, your job is to develop a new idea and hopefully to bring it out of the lab and, and into production in a way which uh, will greatly affect things. I, I don't think you're ever going to see a microbial fuel cell on the back of a car like <laughs> Mr. Fusion. I, it's just not going to happen. But it could transform, for example, our whole water infrastructure where 5% of the electricity we produce is used on, on pumping water and, and treating wastewater. How can we maintain that infrastructure and the, and the energy demands for that infrastructure in the next 10 or 20 years when, when energy becomes so expensive? Well, here's hoping we figure it out. Thank oh. you so much for talking with us. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Visit the Penn State section of Get Local to find programs that make the resources of Penn State University available in your home on your schedule. Categories include Penn State Life, Research, Outdoors, Home and Garden, Arts, PA Stories, Health, Education, and World War II. Penn State on-demand videos are posted with additional online resources at live.psu.edu/vod.